it's the Swole Patrol, it's the Swole Patrol. Dr. Kupinski is super buff and he is a doctor. He knows a lot of shit. I'm just an asshole who likes to <laughs> lift lots of weights. And we have a guest who used to be fat. Now he just eats a lot of fat, but he's not fat. He <laughs> is a software designer, an entrepreneur, and his lipid profile is really good. Yeah. Woo. Oh, look at that. That was a good one. Thanks, man. Well done. You just like it because I called myself an asshole. I, I liked it because it was funny. Yes. That is, you, you, were the, you were the object of the humor. I appreciate that, but it was funny. It was good. Dr. True, yeah. I am definitely going to let you lead today because there's a lot of science going in. I don't want to scare anybody away. It's, it's a lot of good science, and it has to do with nutrition and feeling good and looking good. Um, but there is uh, – we have a guest today. His name is Mr. Dave Feldman. And he is a man who discovered that eating lots of fat made his cholesterol go in the right direction, not the wrong direction. And I want to know what the Feldman Protocol is all about. Dave, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, So uh, am I correct in saying that even to your own surprise, you're someone who noticed that your your cholesterol numbers got better the more fat you ate? Uh, Well, let me qualify that a little bit. Um, I should say that the protocol that you kind of alluded to from earlier, it is true. The more fat I eat, the further down my uh, cholesterol goes, but my baseline cholesterol tends to be higher when I'm on the current diet that I'm on right now, which is the ketogenic diet. Oh, I, I wonder what that is. Because... Wait, your ba- say it again. Your baseline is generally higher on the ketogenic diet, but the more yes, fat, so... the better. Uh-huh. So for example, um, probably my cholesterol, my LDL cholesterol right now is probably in the neighborhood of say 220 to Uh 240. Um, LDL? LDL cholesterol, yes. 240? Mm Mm-hmm. And if I were to eat, if I were to eat a lot of fat uh, over the next three days, it would probably drop by say 70 or 80 milligrams per deciliter. Wow. And why, so, you know, from the layperson, why wouldn't you just eat a lot of fat then? Why wouldn't you up that fat and keep it continu- continually stay at the point where you would get your LDL lower? Well, that's actually the best part of all of this is when I'd gone on the ketogenic diet and saw that my baseline cholesterol had moved up that much, especially my LDL cholesterol, I immediately panicked and got concerned. But my background as a software engineer kind of helped me find what I would call the sort of network pattern that we see right now with cholesterol. And then actually it's much more dynamic than we thought it was. Okay. Oh, for so sure. for example, that's true. Go ahead. Keep going. So for example, um, in my, one of my recent experiments, which was actually last December, I had my LDL, let's say 207 at the beginning of the experiment. And seven days later, I was able to bring it down to 103. Jeez. What, what is your HDL through all this? My HDL is typically in the sixties. But it does kind of depend on the experiment. I've had it as high as 90s. I've had it as low as 40s. And when it's, um, when it's, you know, we do an awful lot of focus on LDL and LDLC and the small particles. But the real story may, may be the HDL. I mean, that, that might be the big story in terms of. Oh, I definitely think so. Yeah, vascular disease, really. At least, at least not the big story, but a major interventional piece of what we should be doing. Hmm. Let's put it that way. Uh, so, so what got your, I'm just curious since we're on the topic, what got your HDL up? Actually, saturated fat. The more saturated fat in particular, but but dietary fat overall, the higher my HDL cholesterol would go up. Uh, this tends to track inversely with LDL cholesterol, um, depending, of course, on whether I'm on a high fat diet or not. So, because this has been my experience too, yeah. uh, my HDL went up the highest it's ever been on this current high fat diet. I mean, my HDL has never been better. In my twenties, it wasn't this good. It's and- crazy. But and your LDL was never low. My LDL, my, I'm I'm a little bit of a cheater because I've been on a statin for 20 years. So so we're looking at a modified LDL. But yes, my LDL is right where it always is. And but can I actually can ahead. I actually give you a prediction? Yeah, I th- I think it's actually quite possible you'll see your LDL even on the statin potentially track upward. And if you were off your statin, it would probably be higher than what it was when you were on a standard American diet and not on a statin from before. And that's because the, and this is really a core of my research. And the reason why I believe that my LDL cholesterol went up in the first place is that cholesterol inside the LDL, LDL, of course, being short for low density lipoprotein, 
that ride shares with what is fat-based energy in the form of triglycerides. Right. And if, if you're powered more by fat, you are necessarily powered more by triglycerides. And therefore, you're probably trafficking more low-density lipoproteins because you're trafficking more of their precursor, VLDLs. Although my, my triglycerides, again, this is a peripheral measurement uh, and a, an ice pick in time, right? Just a single measurement. My triglycerides were also the lowest they've ever been. They were 75. I've never had anything Right, close because to their that. usage is higher. That probably since you're true. being yeah, since you're sense. being powered more by fat, yeah. you actually are depleting yeah. more of those triglycerides on a sense. per particle basis. But is it also possible that I'm also not trafficking that much because the LDL is still kind of low, right? I'm using more, trafficking about the same. You saying you're saying if it weren't the statin, it would go up, right? I I definitely think so. Yeah. Yes, which would not be desirable, or would it make even a difference? We really don't know. But you, what's your opinion? Well, I definitely have a strong opinion on that. Yeah, go um, Overall, and I'm glad you brought up HDL, I actually have a standing challenge that's out there right now. I call it the low-carb cholesterol challenge. And I've pinged a whole lot of uh, lipid-lowering experts and so forth to find me one study, any study. No, It, it must be a non-gene, non-drug study, just a normal swath of people, untreated, for where if they're stratified for having high HDL cholesterol, and low triglycerides that they'll show high cardiovascular disease when they have high LDL cholesterol. And as of yet, nobody's been able to meet that challenge. Yeah, I don't think you're going to find. I don't think you're going to meet that. I, I think that I don't think that's been done. And and but now though, do we really know? We we also need to know what that profile means in terms of outcome too over time. And that's that's where a lot of my opinion comes from. I didn't come to that stratification from trying to just do a whole bunch of searches and seeing what I could find. Yeah. I came to that stratification because of my own experiments. I've, I've had, this is going to sound insane to your listeners, but I've had literally about a hundred blood draws since November, 2015 nice. due to all the different experiments I've done. We see, we've uh, got, we've got some of the graphs here. We should put them up. Can we put up on the website? Yeah, we'll put them up if you don't mind. <laughs> but they look, yeah, they, they're, the, I mean, there's a clearly yeah. inverse relationship between fat and LDL in your, in your data. Right, exactly. And in fact, I managed to get my sister uh, to do one of the experiments with me. That's one of the things you're going to see, which is the identical diet experiment. That's, that's, and that's her cool. her baseline cholesterol and her baseline LDL is almost like half of mine. Yeah. But as you can see, when we ate exactly the same food for 13 days, gram for gram, we ate exactly the same food at the same time, had our blood drawn at the same time. You can see our cholesterol moving up and down in concert with each other. We had about a 93% correlation. Do we know that this sustains over the long term? That's a little bit early for me to say because, yeah. of course, I'm just three years into the diet myself. But the reason that I believe the HDL cholesterol and the triglycerides are so relevant is because if you see the triglycerides being low, you see the HDL being high. To me, given everything I know to this point, that suggests a properly functioning lipid metabolism on one half of the ledger. But on the other half of the ledger, it means there's probably also not a challenge event, some kind of illness or infection or something else that may be a disease that, that the lipid system would be involved in. Right. So typically, both of those being in concert together, in my opinion, is a very good sign. I, I'm still, you know, I have horrible vascular disease in my family. And so it's, I, I'm, I'm too chicken to come off the statin um, because, you know, just, you know, all the statin studies and, and you know, the outcomes do look good for people with disease, right? So theoretically, I have that disease. So it's a little different, a little different. Yeah, you wouldn't fall into the category of, of an what untreated person. Yeah, yeah, an untreated it's, it's sort of technically, yeah. I'm, but, but, I, but, you know, maybe I don't have it. Maybe I'm yeah. overreacting. So anyway. That's that's not something I would gamble mess with. with. I'm yeah, not going to mess with it. Plus, I'm on a tiny dose. I'm like the half of the lowest dose, and I have no side effects or anything, so why not just stay with it? Any downside to that from your research, from your thinking standpoint? Well, I realize it's a contentious topic, and yeah. typically people tend to fall very squarely on one side or the other. Um, I myself personally, I can only speak for myself, knowing what I know now about the complexity of the mechanics of the lipid system, I, I don't think that I would likely take a statin. Well, now, and, now you, you, that's interesting the way you frame that, because, because I don't think about biology as mechanics. I think of it as sets you know, from, from your engineering background, sets and probability of movements in and out of sets. That, that, does that make sense to you to describe it that way? Right. 
Yes. Yeah. And this is actually something I, I try to push back on what I like to call scorecarding because yeah. I feel like it is a common thing with doctors to say, well, I know that this number is out of range from what we've seen against studies that I'd like it to be in range yeah. for, for which yeah, yeah. we see better outcomes. Yeah. And the engineer in me, this is why, you know, a lot of this has taken off for me in that once you find the mechanism behind why I'm able to move the levers I do in order to move my uh, cholesterol up and down, I feel like I'm helping to, um, to elucidate this dynamic nature by getting to the root cause, by getting to the core mechanics of how this lipid system works. There's no doubt that you're onto that, but what I'm thinking about is the relationship of the the chylomicron, the LDLs, and the and its relationship with the 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 endothelium. You know, the, your 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 arteries are all lined by something called the endothelium, which right. is which is an organ system. It's like your skin is an organ system, your endothelium is an organ system. Okay, in its relationship with cholesterol and macrophages and all the some of the some of the inflammatory cell mediators, it's terribly complicated and terribly. Uh, genetically diverse, right? So it that, definitely is. Yeah, so that's the part that I'm obsessing about. I, I, I think you're onto it in terms of the actual lipid metabolism. But what what that means, I just I got a million question marks in my head. And, and maybe as an engineer, you can figure out how best to test that. And maybe you're maybe you're already onto that. Actually, I I have some pretty compelling data. I think you'd find interesting. Please, right ahead. For the first two years, and I should actually provide you this chart. Um, and for the first two years of when I started taking uh, CIMTs, carotid intima media thickness tests, yeah. I was expecting, of course, as most people would, that my the thickness of both my left and right common carotid arteries would either stay the same or increase, as is typically the case for most people with age. Right. And while running at an average LDL-C, the LDL cholesterol, of 200 or higher, and LDLP, the particle count, which we haven't gotten into yet, of 2,000 or higher, both my left and right carotid arteries were regressing in their actual thickness, going from, on the left side, 558 down to 537. And on the right side, which started much higher at 687, which was well into the 80th percent risk factor, down to 536, which was almost identical with the left. Do you have a third point on the, on the chart yet, on the, on the scale? Do I have a, oh, no, a fifth one. So that, those were the first four rows. Okay. But but this fifth one, this actually should be pretty illuminating for you. For this fifth one, I had actually had an experiment where I had intentionally gained 19 pounds of fat. <laughs> I I do quite a lot for my, if, if you ever get really bored, you can go through my list of uh, N of one experiments. They get quite extensive. But in this case, what I was actually seeking to test was what my lipids would be at the higher uh, level of di- of uh, adipose tissue, particularly subcutaneous adipose. Fat. I think I think t- if uh, my my theory has been, by the way, that that issue may be more important than all the rest of this. Just oh, this I, I of, definitely yeah. feel so. But what's yeah. great and not great at the same time, as you'll see in a second, is that sure enough, my LDLC returned to the hundred and thirty that it was before I started the ketogenic diet which of course most doctors would consider to be a net gain. Yeah. Like now I'm well, and now I'm a hundred mill, hundred milligrams per deciliter lower than where I was on my baseline that I just told you about earlier. So what do you suppose happened to my carotid intima media? Didn't change. <laughs> both sides. Didn't change. It shot up oh, substantially. Shot up. Okay. Well, the really? left went to 610 and the right went to 694. Well, you, you're already reporting something that I would, imagine certainly the average physician i bet maybe even the scientific community generally doesn't know that that is that dynamic of a phenomenon right we, we, so he's looking at the thickness of the lining of his the main artery going to his brain in his neck right you know and it's changing it's changing with the cholesterol consistent with his theory which is that when you're how would you describe it when your LDL is up and your HDL is up? How would you describe it? Let's describe it as your. Uh, yeah, I would say it was an inverse pattern yeah, inverse uh, pattern. against what the expectation would be. Right. The expectation would be that if I had high LDL cholesterol and would high LDL particle yeah, count, more that, fat. He, he, the bottom line is What's when he. What's the diet exactly? Uh, well, 
ketogenic. You, when, it, yeah, ketogenic diet, a high fat, low carb diet. Yeah. Can you be more specific? Meaning, like a lot of people confuse just a low carb diet with a ketogenic diet. I'm assuming that you, being so detail oriented, you're talking about a traditional nutritional ketosis. Um, yes. Really extremely high fat, really low to moderate protein. Yeah, let me go ahead and give you uh, the breakdowns because okay. that might be a little more helpful. Okay. So I'm seeking to have about 5% of my carbohydrates, and I should specify net carbs, which is to say total carbs minus fiber at about 5% of what my total calories are per day. My protein at around 20%, although I'm probably closer to 22, 23. You hear that, Drew? And my... Because Drew, Drew's my the guy who's... Dietary I think, fat around 75. I probably are at 80% protein. Yeah, and, so and, yeah. fat meaning butter... Animal fat. Yeah. Coconut oil. All peanuts, the stuff Mike's. Yeah. Coconut oil. Yeah. But butter's included? Absolutely. Oh, definitely. Where are you getting your fats from? What are you, what are you doing? Um, Mostly from fatty meats. Yeah. Um, so. I probably get uh, a lot from dairy, but primarily in the form of cheese. Bacon? Do you uh, have a lot of bacon? Or, oh, yeah. Yeah. I have bacon. So I, I, I'm sort of I'm balancing it out a little bit. I'm watching it right now, by the way. I'm, I'm trying to get it back under control a bit. And I've had the, some shakes with the coconut oil, coconut oil in it. And you said you've, uh, you've followed this diet protocol for three years now? Um, so technically, yes. However, some of my experiments, especially in the second phase of my research, which started about a year ago, included some carbohydrate swapping to test another portion of my data, which is I believe you can further change around your lipid numbers based on what your existing glycogen stores are. The glycogen stores in your liver and in your muscles. Okay. And it's sure enough, what I'm trying to come to is an understanding as to why the body would feel the need to mobilize this fat-based energy and under what conditions. And honestly, surprisingly, I'm actually, I'm impressed at how fast I've gotten to where I'm at right now, as far as finding out what these different levers are. And that's the other lever is if your glycogen stores, it's somewhat theoretical because I'm not really doing liver biopsies on myself. Yeah, go ahead though. Uh, But it's somewhat theoretical in that past a certain threshold of glycogen stores in the liver, the body then feels less of a need to mobilize VLDLs to provide that fat-based energy to our tissues and therefore less of the succeeding LDLs. Those LDL particles, of course, are what we're then picking up for the LDL cholesterol. And I I really, I kind of want to emphasize something. What you're seeing with this inversion pattern that I'm talking about, as you mentioned earlier, you were talking about chylomicrons. Those come from the gut, from food we just ate. So if I eat a hamburger right now, packages into chylomicrons, that's kind of the counterpart to VLDLs. That's, That's food I just ate. The VLDLs are what the body is pulling from storage. It pulls fatty acids from our fat stores, packages them into VLDLs. And so basically the research I had is um, isolating this kind of window of time that our body is up and down regulating those VLDLs in counterbalance with the chylomicrons. So therefore, if I eat a lot of fat, what I'm telling my body is, hey, I'm in a state of abundance. There's, there's plenty of energy. And therefore it says, well, then I don't need to mobilize as much. And because I'm mobilizing less of these VLDLs, there'll be less LDLs and therefore when I get my test at the doctor's office, I end up with less cholesterol being detected. And, and yet it seems like in addition, I, it's a little, I'm a little confused. We're, so we're mobilizing left VLDL, but we are mobilizing adipose tissue, right? Fat from our adipose. Absolutely. So we're just doing it's, it at a, at a rate that doesn't reflect a high level of VLDL or it's not packaged as VLDL. Uh, well, the, the process end to end is that most of the fat that's on board a VLDL came from adipose tissue that got hydrolyzed, full body adipose tissue. And as it gets hydrolyzed, these free fatty acids bind to a protein called the albumin, brings it around to the liver, the liver packages them into VLDLs. And this is really happening around the clock. The only thing is the body is trying to determine how much it wants to pull from your fat stores based on this kind of window of time of three days. And of course, from moment to moment based on your your insulin and your glucagon, that kind of back and forth that's where'd you, happening. Where'd you go over three days? That's just been your data? That's just been my data. Yeah. I, I didn't, I would have thought when I started this all out that it'd be weeks. And at that time, I, it, in talking about it with other, uh, I'm not a medical professional, but in talking about it with medical professionals, they were like, no, 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 it's months. Like almost everybody thinks 
you have to do um, a few different lifestyle changes and then you do a cholesterol test in a few months and then maybe you'll see a difference. And that turned out to be flatly wrong. I thought it was weeks and I was wrong. After I started testing it, nope, it turned out to be days. In fact, the first public presentation I did on my data, I wrapped an experiment around the conference so that I could take my blood um, on the Friday beforehand, wow. did a presentation on the Sunday and told everybody then I bet my reputation and everything that I know that you're watching my LDL plummet live as huh. of course they were watching me eat cheese sandwiches uh. and, and burgers and so forth. And sure enough, I took the test the day after and my LDL had dropped by 73 milligrams per decimal. So my LDLP had dropped at 1,115. I'm still a little, a little confused about where you think the VLDL story is because we used to do a lot of worrying about those particles. Are you, are you essentially saying just don't worry about them? Oh, it, actually, let me emphasize. VLDLs, I'm absolutely secreting more VLDLs than the average person on a standard American diet. And you are too, yeah. if you're on a carnivorous diet. Yeah. The, the difference is, is if you take a blood test, what you're capturing, and it's worth really emphasizing this the right way, what you're capturing is what is in transit and not yet in use. So in other words, when you're having your triglycerides depleted off of those VLDLs, they remodel to LDLs. Oh. That's just a stage before LDLs. Right. So it's not the triglycerides themselves that are the problem. It's triglycerides that are not in use. Got it. It's triglycerides that are accumulating in the bloodstream because you get you've maxed you out your personal fat threshold, That's very for example. Interesting. That's very interesting. So we're going to take a little break, but, but you know, are you, are you aware that in your N of one research here and the way you're doing it, there is somewhat of a philosophy of science challenge in this, at least a philosophy of medical science in what you're doing. Do you, do you, do you get that? Oh, I'm, I'm well aware. <laughs> yeah, so let's address that because the more you talk, the more I get fascinated by that topic. So, Mike, there, there is a, the medicine right now, the way, the way medical research is done is deeply flawed. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's it's forget the way it's funded, all that stuff, just the, the, the concept of taking large populations and looking for average responses mm-hmm. doesn't take into account – really how one person's body works and may completely miss how we're actually working, right? So there's sort of a, there's a philosophy of science problem in medicine right now. And you've done much thinking about it. Where is he? Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking to him. No, you. Have you no, done? let's, let's, let's <laughs> take a break. I want to take a break, we'll, but I just want to okay. know that you've thought about it before I, I ambush you after the break. You've thought a lot no. about it? Oh, I've, I've not only thought a lot about it, but in a roundabout way, I've kind of become sort of a, not intentionally. I've kind of become a bit of a central figure on that very topic. Well, you should, but, but you've I, got the right training for it. You could be that person. I, I was saying, I hope you wrote a paper on this because it was, it it, it could change the way medical research is done. I, I, again, it's scalability is an issue. But but okay, we'll take a break, and we'll, there's a lot more to say here. All right, All right. we'll be right back with our guest. Well, it's about time for athletes, trainers to report for the start of the fall season, but we are still dealing with that extreme heat. So even if you're training indoors, dehydration is a major issue for amateurs and pros. Water, sports drinks, they do not do a great job. I've known this for a long time. That's why I wanted to develop a product. Instead, Hydrolyte came along, so I strongly suggest you stay ahead of your hydration with Hydrolyte. The best way to stay hydrated is with a proper balance of sodium, glucose, and water. And Hydrolate does this better than anything else I've tried. Everyone here swears by it. My wife, my kids, my patients. I use it if patients need rehydration. It's a way to replete hydration orally. This gets you ahead of the game. And so you can sometimes avoid hospitalization things in my experience. Hydrolate comes in great flavors like orange berry and lemonade. Available as a pre-mixed drink, a powder, or my personal preference is these effervescence tablets. You simply drop in a glass of water or a bottle of water. Literally, uh, we don't leave home without these. Compared to sports drinks, Hydrolyte delivers up to four times the electrolytes with 75% less sugars. Hydrolyte solutions are appropriate for all ages, and each bottle or package includes easy-to-follow instructions. This is the best hydration product out there, period, and you can find Hydrolyte at Rite Aid, or at hydrolite.com slash Dr. Drew, D-R-D-R-E-W. And for a limited time, our listeners can save 30% on Hydrolite. I just sent my daughter over to buy this stuff. She's like, I need Hydrolite. I'm like, go to the website and use the code Dr. Drew 18, D-R-D-R-E-W 18 at checkout. That is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com, hydrolite.com slash D-R-D-R-E-W 18. To use that code, get 30% off. You won't need any other hydration products. It's the best. 
All right, welcome back to the Swole Patrol. Dave Feldman is our guest, and we're having some admittedly geeky, but some very, Are you okay, very okay that I'm absolutely deep into this. No, I, I, yeah. we're having a, a yeah. fascinating discussion yeah. on ketogenic diets and its reflection upon not only uh, LDL but really all the intricacies. We're, we're, we've of, just moved beyond that to a yeah. meta level now. So now we're into now we're into science geekism. I, I, I want to circle back a little bit, Doctor Drew. Yeah. For those listening, when you, they hear a physician say the way medical research is done is deeply flawed, yeah, can you break that down a little bit? All right, you're gonna you're gonna have to help me with this, um, which is that uh, it's essentially. Let's put it this way: you and I do a lot of talking about the genetic diversity that's out there, mm-hmm. and you and I just just a simple thing like how people respond to exercise or diet. You and I are in complete agreement. There's a massive spectrum of what's good for one person may not be good for another. If we were doing traditionally funded medical research, we'd miss all that. We would come up with some average diet for the average person that's average good. Uh, and then we do some what's called pea mining <laughs> to make sure our data turned out the way we wanted it, which is the, which is the nefarious part of the story. But uh, am, I, am I overstating the case? I – frankly, I, I think you're barely getting started. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to be – I don't want to get – Start taking sides because because in in doing the kind of research we do, I mean, very good things have happened, but but it's it's hitting a critical threshold where people are getting frustrated. So go ahead, where where are we at with this with you? Well, first of all, let me emphasize: I believe that unfortunately in nutrition science, there's a lot of dogmatism. There's a lot of casting one side as evil. And I, I try not to subscribe to that. I think well, that's most bizarre. people are well meaning. That, that's that's yeah. unfortunately you're now falling victim to the standard personality dysfunctions of our time, which is that because we don't have family and community and religion, we've now developed ideological camps where the only reason you know anything is you look to your camp and go, oh, okay, and anyone outside of that camp is an evil whore. Right. <laughs> that's it. Right. And that, right. And that's, that's, that's primitive thinking that is intolerable. Forget it. Now, now I want to say that to open because I actually take great pains as best as I can. And if you follow me on Twitter or, or my blog and so forth, I try to do the best that I can to be as even handed and as to, um, uh, to try to be good to both sides. Now, that said, you actually brought this up from a little earlier, and I think this is germane to this particular t- topic. Many people don't realize, for example, that LDL particles actually play a very large immunological role in the body. Yep. They help to battle back infection, for example. They also play a very big part in repair. And this is these factors are not accounted for in a lot of the data that you're getting put in front of you. So when you hear something like, well, this helps to bring down uh, total events, or this helps to reduce your chance of dying of a heart attack by X percent. You're not actually getting the counterbalancing side. And by doing so, this means your chance of dying by infection has increased Y percent. No, the, and this the, is a big the, the problem. Classic, because classic example is drink wines, you'll reduce your heart disease, but you get cancer more often. Or, or you know, there's all there's all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff like that out there. Or, you, you know, it, if you're an alcoholic. No, exactly. And, that's, and this is a problem. Is, Go ahead. Sorry. Is I, I certainly feel like uh, the concept of all-cause mortality is a very serious one we should, we should consider when powering any study that claims a mortality benefit. Yeah. Because really, anytime you're saying, hey, we tracked one group of people and they died less of thing X than this other group of people, really what you're saying is, is the other group of people – Diet of something else more. Well, to be fair, that's you, that's usually commented on in the research. You you you'll if there is an something unexpected like that, it, it, you'll you'll see it. But it, it may not. But that be in comment the, doesn't make the headlines. No, absolutely. Oh, headlines listen, there, there are no headlines in medicine. That's what drives me insane. There, this is science. Science is about disproving things, not about writing headlines. And, and so, absolutely. Yeah, and so I, I I always look for that, and you'll see it in the discussion. It's in the you know sometimes early in the reports, then late in the report it's left out because that's not what they're interested in looking at. They're looking at the f- effect of their drug. But uh, yes, you're, you're absolutely right on that. But but don't be as dismayed about that as you – you may be more dismayed than you should be because it's in the literature. It, it doesn't get – people that read it properly see it. Well, it's, it's certainly something that I, I want there to be more transparency of in the area of cholesterol research in particular. Yeah is I feel it's something for which there's certainly a lot of core opinion of. I mean, you've grown up with it. I've grown up with it. Lipidor commercials and family members that have doctors that have said that they're worried about their cholesterol and so forth, that 
I feel like we're already kind of starting from one sideline that we have to work our way back from to try to try to really parse out what the data truly says. And for me, one of the most stunning moments that I had early on was finding out that in statin trials, there's actually not been a single statin trial that's shown a statistical significant a statistically significant decrease in all cause mortality, save Jupiter. Yeah. Uh, and the Jupiter trial required um, that you be inflamed coming yeah. into that you had actually an elevated CRP. Yeah. Well, that completely stunned me because certainly the impression everybody's going to have who's going on a statin is that it's going to reduce their chance of dying, period. Well, there's, I, I don't know, I, maybe, but um, the, the, there's another way of looking at that is that the, the, one, of the, one of the other flaws of medical research are the, the timelines. Uh, and they, they, they clearly weren't going to do something long enough to show the, what you're looking for. You know what I'm saying? They just they want to see. I agree. Yeah, they just don't have it. They just won't do it. So. But the, but but wouldn't you agree that in saying, hey, wait, we want to do a drug trial for say two to three years, for yeah. example. Yeah. And from that, we want to detect how much people have gained a benefit from the drug. Yeah. Then sure, if we saw a dramatic change, if we saw a twenty or thirty percent drop in mortality, we could say, you know, there's a lot of confidence in the power of the data that we see in this drug. The problem is that even if that were the case, we already have an issue in that the, the buildup of atherosclerosis, which is the uh, plaque that builds up in the ar- arterial wall, that doesn't take place from front to back in two to three years. Right. That can be decades, of course. That's right. That's right. And, and so in a sense, it's hard to, it's hard to reconcile for me personally well, that drug trials – Go ahead. Well, you're doing some of the same stuff with your carotid arteries. That, that's the kinds of data they use. So you're relying on the same kinds of stuff. Maybe you're going to die younger from this diet. You see what I'm saying? Oh, oh I, for sure. I, I'm well, impressed with all this. I want I want your data, but I don't know that it's going to reduce all-cause mortality. Well, and by that same token, even with as much data as I've accumulated with the CIMT, I'm not making that claim. And in yeah. fact, I think I've made publicly the claim that I'd still prefer to have like five years of CIMT data before I even get truly, um, truly impressed by the yeah. numbers. That said, the magnitude of difference in the CIMT is something that was pretty jaw dropping to me. Hey, let just me, how far drop, how far down it had gone. Let's go back. It's stunning. In fact, in fact, it makes me wonder. I make sure you talk to a radiologist to make sure that those are changes that you can really hang your hat on. But you know, in other words, they're not just statistical phenomena related to the the, the instrument you're using or something. I, I, I suspect it's not, but. You want to double? I'm sure you did. You check that. Uh, well, actually, it's funny you mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, since this had come up, what I'm trying to do is see if I can get um, redundancy by having possibly two or even three CIMTs yeah. on the same day every three different, to six months, depending machines. on if I can find them in different, town. Different machines, different different rate or different readings to, to different people reading it. Um, but but I want to go back to the philosophy of science. So so what do we do here? There, there's a bigger discussion. And by the way, were you, did you have any biological training? I, I didn't actually. You, you think, about, you understand, you, you kind of think like a biologist. That's really unusual for an engineer. About this time, three years ago, I knew next to nothing about cholesterol. Well, you're, 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 you're getting the holistic kind of picture pretty, pretty good. Uh, I, well, I, but, gotta, but I did, I did start with one advantage. I have worked on networks for 30 years. Yeah. And because of that, I understand um, something known as uh, distributed object networks and uh, something else that's going to sound super geeky, but it's a uh, composite responses. And I'm happy that I had that engineering training when deciding to become obsessed with cholesterol homeostasis, Yeah, because now all of a sudden all of it just clicked into place. It actually made a lot of sense. Yeah. Your lipid system is very much, very much like a cloud network. In fact, I joke to, other people now that your your human body has been doing cloud networking long before the humans have written a single line of code. Yes, I, I would agree with you. This this particular biology is particularly suited to that model. What were you going to say? I was going to say from a from a personal level, what even got you down this road? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the initial spike in my cholesterol. I had a period of time where I panicked between. Uh, so I I started on a ketogenic diet and I had a story similar to yours, Dr. Drew, where I felt transformed. I had never felt better. I was angry with myself. I didn't discover it sooner. Although, although I I keep telling myself that 
maybe it's – we don't know for the young guys. We don't know. For, but for a guy my age, I mean, even if it's not healthy for a three-year-old, it could easily be healthy for a six-year-old. So, But go ahead. But, but yeah, and then here I get about seven and a half months later, and both my sister and my dad had been inspired and started the diet about the same time but had only seen a small bump in their cholesterol, mm. whereas I had seen a massive rise. Mm. And at that time, I didn't understand what I do now. That actually, uh, and for your listeners who go on a ketogenic diet, there's going to be a number of them out there who go on this diet and they don't understand this. You actually have a higher likelihood of seeing this so-called hyper response if you have lower body fat, lower total overall adipose mass, and if you're more athletic. Hmm. Generally speaking, people who see this hyper response are the ones you wouldn't associate normally with having high cholesterol. You tend to think of the person sitting on their couch um, eating bonbons and, you know, not doing anything. It's actually, no, it's, it's on the ketogenic diet. It's frustrating for them because oftentimes they'll say, this is the best I've ever felt in my life. Why is this one marker going out of control for me? And I, I present a mechanistic model. There's a mechanistic reason why it's going higher. It's because they actually are being powered more by triglycerides carried on VLDLs. And it makes a lot more sense from a network standpoint, because less of the adipose mass, less of the body fat that's all around your body, those are kind of like the local staging and pacing areas, kind of like uh, your local FedEx facility for delivering packages. You've now decided to go ahead and have kind of more of a global FedEx delivery that's you know being carried around by a plane. It might be a bit of a stretch of an analogy, but if you can follow me, the point is there's just a little more allocation that goes towards those VLDLs over the free fatty acids that are nearby the muscle tissue that's in like the fat stores, yep. uh, the adipose uh, sites that are nearby, for example. So I want to push you back over to the philosophy of science. So what do we do? I, 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 funny we're having this conversation. I've been thinking about it a little bit lately, and I, I, I've not had a good answer. Do you have an answer or do you have a challenge? I, I definitely have a challenge, and my challenge is that there needs to be more transparency on both the uh, hypothesis and the design of experiments. So oh, they're geez. really in the, in the execution of the design of experiments that should have its own transparency. There should be other parties involved that can confirm that you're not capturing data and then post hoc, you know, just what you were talking about, the P mining, for example, yeah. this is usually, Hey, we've got a data set. We know the general narrative we would like to shoot for based on where we got the funding from. And now we're going to actually try to find, you know, in our numbers, the narrative we're, we're sort of looking for, right? Well, they, that's routine now. That's just ridiculous, but it's routine. It's routine, but yeah. it's, I don't think it's good science. Oh, in my it's opinion. terrible. Are you kidding? It's, it's insane. And, and people don't even do the null hypothesis anymore. They just don't do it. And so, you know, coming up with a skill, a, a very carefully designed hypothesis, people aren't even thinking that way. They're, they're not doing science, right? I mean, I was trained, you know, in in the scientific method. And I think most of our medical researchers were not. Yeah. And, and unfortunately I, in a roundabout way, I feel like cholesterol in particular may be one of the dam breakers because if it does turn out to be true that there are people with high HDL, low triglycerides, and I mean, super crazy high levels of LDL and LDLP, that will be a real stunner because the lipid hypothesis has survived up, you know, what, 50 yeah. years now. Yeah. And LDLP. the expectation is, LDLP. the expectation is they should be dropping like flies. Explain LDLP to us. Uh, oh, LDLP is actually the particle count itself. So to kind of go back a little bit, VLDLs are themselves a lipoprotein. Yeah. Um, in fact, the very last L is the lipoprotein, and when they remodel to LDLs, and the LDLs, and usually when I'm just saying LDL, I do mean LDLP. Well, when you get a cholesterol test, an advanced one like a nuclear magnetic resonance test, that'll actually break out not just your LDL cholesterol, but your LDLP. And that's a count of all of those low density lipoproteins that are in your bloodstream for that sample. Per unit volume. I can't count of particles per unit volume, how much actually flying around there. Uh, so so I, I want to push back on you again about philosophy of science, because I, I think that, of course, all you're suggesting is good, but I don't think that would get rid of our problem. There's something about the how the way we study populations uh, that is at issue, and I and I and you being an N of one and coming up with all this inf interesting data, 
something in there is is I don't know. I'm going to be thinking about it for a while. But but that that distinction between these averages and populations, and what we can learn, and what we can learn studying an n of one, there has to be some way of hybridizing these two things. I, I definitely do think so. In fact, you, you kind of almost teed me up on that one. Effectively, what I would like is a lot more people that sort of live like I live. Um, as as a fun fact to know and tell, I literally take pictures of every single thing that I've eaten since November, 2015. In fact, it's at, at every conference I speak at, I say, I'll give you a hundred dollars. If you can capture one thing that I've ingested that I didn't take a picture of. First. Wow. Wow. And nobody's collected on Probably it. Yet, a not even my wife. Mouth, a nap flew in your mouth somewhere along the way in the middle of the night. But and, it, and it's, and it absolutely sounds obsessive because it does have to be somewhat obsessive to yeah. accomplish that. But that along with the hundred different blood tests that I've gotten, many of them are very wide spectrum where I'm picking up things like IGF-1 and HSCRP and even obscure ones that almost nobody gets like glucagon. If I were to be, think, imagine this for a second. Imagine a hundred people just living a normal life, but they had say uh, an additional responsibility that they treat as kind of like a part-time job. Part of their part-time job was to basically be a professional lab rat. Yeah. They would track everything they eat and they would get very high frequency blood tests. And in the course of doing that, that data set would get used and mined by tons and tons of research teams for many different purposes. I believe that could actually advance science in ways we can't even imagine right now. Well, because I, all kinds I, yeah. of patterns would come forth from it. I have three or four comments. One is but we're really talking about nutritional research, and there's a lot of other kinds of research that need to be done something like this number two we didn't have the computing power or the communication ability to to aggregate all this data that we easily do now number three this is the way science used to be done i i was trained in sort of the liberal arts of science you know what people were what faraday was thinking about when he was messing around with his you know globes and and, uh, electricity and and it was a very local phenomenon you know uh if science the history of science and and it feels like we need to gravitate back to that it, at least in terms of from whence we are collecting our data now that we from have from whence com- we came from now we have this computing power we can use all that. it 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 just I don't know there's there's you're onto something here I'll tell you that am I am I wrong well, I, in saying all that I, I certainly think so I mean I if there's anything that has been a little bit of a disappointment for me to be perfectly honest, is my whole engineering career, I've always thought of engineers to be kind of a sister to medicine, Mm. that we're both under the same tent of science. And you get a room full of engineers, we cannot wait to challenge each other and tear each other down. And that to us is our culture. That's just part of the process. If you're, we're not going to make good products, if we don't already have like, every other person in that meeting being a critic. And it may be tough and hard. But from my perspective, that's, that is kind of its own scientific method yes. is you're trying to tear down yes, your darlings. Science, science is about and disproving things. That's what it is. It is. It is. And I got to, I got to be honest. I feel like it's very different in medicine. Well, I feel it, like it can happen in medicine, but I'll tell you why it's different because medicine is strictly hierarchical and, right. and it is from the moment you arrive in, in your training, you are told you are an underling. These are the superiors. These are the anointed. Listen to what the almost cultish. What, what I've been a little critical lately, calling it kind of culty, where you you adopt a way of thinking that you, you say cunty or culty. culty. Okay, uh, and, and and I, I the hierarchical uh, sort of structure is militaristic. It's an absolutely military structure. Nursing has the exact same thing. Uh, and so, you know, there's a reason we're that way in terms of taking care of patients, uh, but it's where the weakness is that you're describing. It, it's certainly, it's certainly something that I've not only seen, but I've, I now am in contact with a lot of, for example, undergrads who will flatly tell me that, that a lot of their capability in their career to move forward is in what team they can get under. Yeah. And it's, it is not about challenging. It's not about the challenging the authority. Are there. I, I, you're not the authority. You don't get challenged. You can challenge each other at your level, but you can't challenge up. That's the problem. Or you can, but God help you. And <laughs> and that's that's a problem. And and to be you know, and again, back to the practice of medicine. Let me be a little defensive, which is the the practice is much more experiential than the applied engineering. You know what I mean? It, it's a lot of stuff I do is almost by scent. 
uh, and and the the judgments I have built over long periods of time to keep the metaphor going when I smell a certain thing, and, and that's in the, the science is then there just to back us up after the fact. Does that? But you know, can I yeah. can I also mention on that? Yeah, I feel more than ever doctors are being robbed from being their own scientists. Oh my God, you have no being, for being their own clinicians, not just scientists, being, being their own. Absolutely, person. there's oh, just, there's. There's much more defensive medicine. There's much more much guideline. More. It's, all it is. it's all it is. I, it's all it is. It's, and it's painful to me to watch because I've now talked to so many doctors, especially in the low carb community that practice something that they feel they can't fully, uh, wholly endorse back to their patients. It's too dangerous. Uh, and it's too some, dangerous. some Literally. of them, some of them don't care. Some of them are just like, I, I don't care. I care too much about what I'm seeing in my patients that I feel strongly is the solution that but, they need. But if something goes wrong, the attorneys will crucify them and by the way Absolutely. if you're doing something like that and the insurance is paying for it they'll stop paying because it's not in their protocols it's not in their in their criteria they, they then then when the patient goes why won't you pay for my visits well the if the doctor would just give us the right information of course you'll pay for the visits do you see the conundrum which is the right information is you're going to stop doing what you're doing and start doing it our way it's it's, it's a serious problem because particularly as I've come to understand what blood work moves, what levers uh, probably one of the single most powerful blood markers you can get is fasting insulin. Mm -hmm. And I think fasting insulin should be a part of every basic blood panel right now. Good luck paying for that. (laughs) Exactly. And that's, and that's what I hear often is people will, will ask me, you know, if I had to pick three markers that I would have them get, I would have them get a lipid panel. I'd have them get, um, and not just for cholesterol, but yeah. in particular for what triglycerides can say. Getting, triglycerides can say something about what's ahead. Getting the NMR, um, getting the, the, the NMR panel, and maybe great if everyone get an NMR. Absolutely, Nobody's but also, that. but also fasting insulin and HSCRP. All, right, so let's, let's, all three of those yeah. can unpack to well, do, even if they don't tell you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. do do us a minute on that. We've not talked about insulin yet. Go ahead, give us a couple minutes on that. Uh, so certainly, this is part of why low triglycerides and high HDL can be very relevant as they are often very tightly correlated with your uh, insulin load. If you're hyperinsulinemic, it's very common that you have the profile known as atherogenic dyslipidemia, which is, of course, uh, low HDL, high triglycerides, and oftentimes um, high LDL cholesterol. Sometimes called the metabol- which of course, metabolic syndrome. Right. And that, that often comes with metabolic syndrome. Yeah. And often well, maybe it's the people- cause of it. No one knows that maybe you're, you may be describing the cause, but go ahead. It, it, yeah. it might be, but there are now a lot of people who, a lot of doctors who, um, and it's somewhat anecdotal, but there are a lot of doctors who um, attack when somebody's having elevated uh, fasting, or, sorry, elevated fasting insulin yeah. early on so that it doesn't ultimately develop into type 2 diabetes because oftentimes your fasting insulin is going up even while your glucose remains the same because your pancreas is picking up Let's not mistake that, though, that intervention that reduces the risk of flipping into type 2. Let's, let's, let's not confuse that with necessarily disrupting hyperinsulinemic, hyperinsulinemic dyslipidoproteinemia. Oh, fuck off. You know, well, he's the, used the phrase. I'm just repeating it back. <laughs> Right, you might you might be just doing Say one thing, but not the other. Fast. Point is, you might not be affecting the cholesterol deposition in the arteries. You may just be affecting the potential for diabetes, it, which is absolutely possible. I mean, one thing or another, though, I do feel me personally, given what I've come to know thus far, and particularly in how I've been able to how I've been able to change and modify my own numbers, I certainly believe insulin is probably a very underappreciated power player. Well, this is your it, this is Mike's you, thing, Mike's position on this, yeah. And it, and the area under the curve of how much you need to use insulin in order to manage your lifestyle, probably the lower it is, the longer your survival. Given everything that I know up to this point, I think that's probably true. I think that's a great. I think it's a great. We're gonna to have to have a different conversation about that, folks. To, <laughs> but you, but that's what you advocate all the time. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure that it's everything metabolic that people make it out to be. But I, I do think that it's a greatly overlooked. Aspect yeah, it's a big part of the story, of and we're busy story, focusing yeah. on LDLs, and we don't even think about that. Right. right. Yeah. That's just my take. Well, and for what it's worth, this isn't to say that I'm anti-insulin. The point is, is if your insulin is persistently high, the question is why not. That yeah. insulin is the bad guy. It's, right. it's easy for people to confuse 
the marker for the disease. If you're a bodybuilder and, and your insulin's constantly high, I understand. Yeah, I totally get right. it. That's it, different. But if you're a soccer mom, there's we need to have a real conversation. And we we touched on, but I, I want to reemphasize that the subcutaneous fat, particularly the central fat, that that's a bigger story to be told yet. That that's a big piece of this. It absolutely is. I, I have nothing else to add. I, 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 honestly, I am so happy. <laughs> I feel like gonna, I've I've been enhanced. And I've Dave, grown. Dave, uh, you know, as we wrap up, I just want to say, I really, my hats off to you as a as a non scientist to have this level of commitment. Really, for the sake of uh, something outside of self promotion. I mean, you're really just kind of trying to open people's eyes and using a skill set that you had. Uh, it's very commendable, and I just wanted to let you know. I that. think it could be really. It, it, Thank it, you. It could be historically important. You know that I don't know where this all goes, but but science has a problem, and you're you're on top of it. Cholesterolcode dot com, and then at Dave Keto. That's of course K E T O. For those of you who don't know, uh, he that is how you can get in touch with this man on Twitter, Dave. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you so much for having me on. You bet. We're off, but I we didn't talk. You know, the, it, you know, there's a reproducibility crisis in science too, where the things get f- detected and then you can never reproduce it. Right, and right. It well, that's all the time. In that's biology, so. that's the problem we've seen. I, at least I've noticed with the artificial sweetener stuff everything, is that it's impossible to reproduce the, be, and nowhere worse than on you know. the brain science side. That's where it really is awful. I, right. I wish it was mandatory that they did uh, at least a random reproduction on a you know like yeah. for example yeah. for every 10 experiments yeah, yeah. at least one different team had to reproduce one well, in that's 10 what that, so that again that's what it's supposed to be it's science done properly but it's it, we, we've run amok but but um what's what's even more heartbreaking to me is that i would say mm, 85 to 90 percent of the medical graduates since certainly 1999 could not even have this conversation we just had. <laughs> they just wouldn't. Be, they wouldn't know what we were talking about. Which is doesn't that tell you that's something? something? Yeah. Well, not just about the science part. Yeah, they're, they're not being trained as scientists. They're being trained as technicians or something. Well, thank you. Thanks keep, again. Let man. me know what you're doing in the future. I love to keep up on this, and if I can help, let me know. Sure. Okay. Well, and I'll I'll actually have some. I can't I can't say just yet, but I may actually have some pretty exciting news soon too. Ooh. So Ooh, let's if I do I'll bring it out here. Well, you know the Twitter we'll followers actually suggested him as a guest. So well, well, thank our Twitter followers. Yeah. They wanted yeah. Thank yeah, they thank you. Is if, is that, if they if, if, is Facebook. Going? No, it's not on. Oh, <laughs> God damn it! No, this is going to be an actual <laughs> podcast where people uh, listen. All right. Well, we'll thank the Twitter. <laughs> Put it out soon. Push it out soon. So. All right. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hey, everybody, it is the Swole Patrol Podcast. You can find me on Twitter at Mike Catherwood. And Dr. Drew is at Dr. Drew, of course. Join the email list today. Send your questions, drdrew.com slash contact. And put Swole at the top of the email so we can get your comments. And this will get you a weekly email reminder with a link to this show and all the great shows that Dr. Drew and I do and all the shows that Dr. Drew does by himself and, of course, with Adam Carolla, the great ace man. Please tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes. Don't forget to rate us five stars. And on Podbean or Google Play, all three help us out. We also are on YouTube slash Dr. Drew and uh, hope you can give us all your comments, even if they're if you're a troll and you want to destroy our feelings and our emotions. Support our sponsors and the show. Click on the banners on drdrew.com for the links for special discounts for the products Dr. Drew and I endorse 100%. Send questions and comments to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Swole Patrol Podcast, or on Twitter at Swole Patrol Pod. And uh, be good. Be swole. Hashtag Swole Patrol.